Hi, I'm Kiana Rush, and this is week three of pharmacology tutoring for Farm 2 for Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine. This week we're going to be talking about peripheral neuromuscular blockers and also spasmolytic drugs. So neuromuscular blockers, a good way to differentiate them from spasmolytics, they're working peripherally. So they're working on the muscles themselves, generally. And there's two types. There's depolarizing and also non-depolarizing. So they work a little bit differently to achieve the same effects. And another good thing to know is they're really highly ionized. So they're not gonna pass the blood-brain barrier. And if you remember, most barriers in general are made of phospholipids and those are nonpolar. So only things that are nonpolar can usually cross barriers. And since these are highly ionized drugs, they're usually charged and they can't bypass the lipid membranes because of that. Spasmolytics, on the other hand, work centrally. So that means they're working on the brain themselves or upper motor neurons. And because of this, they're probably less ionized than a neuromuscular blocker. Another word for them is antispasmodics, and they usually work by causing hyperpolarization of the cells, and it's usually through the main inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA. And remember that GABA works with chloride. Always good to know. So remember, neuromuscular blockers, peripheral, very ionized, spasmolytics, central, and treat more kind of chronic pain situations. Let's get started. So I love this image. It's just kind of your general presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuromuscular junction type of image, but it's really beautiful to describe the neuromuscular blockers. So let's see if I can get what I need all in one frame. I think I can. All right, so there are two types of neuromuscular blockers. And the first type is going to be the non-depolarizing. And remember, these are working peripherally. So the non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers work by antagonizing nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the muscles. So here's the muscle fiber in this image. This image is from Semantic Scholar. It's a great site. If you ever want extra resources, it's free. So here's the muscle fiber. And because non-depolarizing neuromuscular blockers are antagonists, they're actually going to block these receptors. And because these receptors are blocked, no acetylcholine is going to reach the muscle and less spasm is going to happen. Similarly, depolarizing neuromuscular blockers are also going to stop that action potential, but they're going to do it by being an agonist of the acetylcholine receptors. So let's clear these out. By agonizing the acetylcholine receptor, we're essentially dumping more acetylcholine, really stimulating these muscles kind of overdoing it to the point where the muscle says, that's enough, I can't do anymore. And because of that, there's so many action potentials. The muscle becomes exhausted and then paralyzed. So remember, non-depolarizing agents don't cause an action potential. They antagonize and block, as where depolarizing neuromuscular blockers increase receptor activation and eventually the muscle becomes exhausted and paralyzed from having so many action potentials thrown at it. So you can either overdo it or block it. Those are the two ways to look at neuromuscular blockers. And remember, these are working peripherally. And I made everything that works peripheral in purple. I just thought they kind of went together. 
All right, so those are the neuromuscular blocking mechanisms of action, all you really need to know on that. Let's move on to spasmolytic drugs. So spasmolytics, these are a little different. These are working centrally. So remember they're working on the brain themselves or upper motor neurons. The first drug we're gonna talk about is carisoprodol. And I remember this drug kind of for what it does. Acute spasm from overwork or injury. I remember in the name, carisoprodol, kind of if you just look at the beginning, carry. Okay, so if I was carrying a lot of things, I might get overworked and I might eventually spasm. Like I just moved apartments and yeah, I was pretty tired the next day from carrying a lot of things. So if that helps you remember carisoprodol, if you carry a lot of things, you might have a spasm, you might be overworked. It's a good drug to treat that. And this drug does have a dependence risk. So it could be mildly addicting. Good to remember that if you're gonna be prescribing these types of drugs. Another drug that's very similar is cyclobenzaprine. And again, this is also working centrally because it's a spasmolytic. This drug is actually a sedative and also anticholinergic at the same time. What's different about cyclobenzaprine is it can be used in pregnancy. And it's pregnancy class B. So pregnancy class B, if you want to differentiate, there's also a B in cyclobenzaprine. And I remember it's, you know, fine for a pregnant person to ride a bicycle. So I put a picture of a bicycle in, if you want to remember, there's a B in cyclobenzaprine, pregnancy class B, and it would be perfectly fine for a pregnant person to ride a bicycle. Make sure they wear a helmet. Same thing, this can be used for acute spasm from overwork or injury, can reduce inflammation. And one side effect that kind of differs with cyclobenzaprine is constipation. Good to remember. All right. Here's a drug you may remember. Diazepam, we actually talked about this in week one. And if you remember, it's also a anxiolytic, so it tones down anxiety. It's classified as a benzodiazepine. And if you remember, benzodiazepines also have a risk for dependence. But this drug can be used in chronic spasm. Here it says it's a spasmolytic, it's working centrally anxiolytic, anti-seizure. But remember, we talked about this drug in week one. And if you remember, what does it do to chloride channels? This is a good question to remember. It increases the frequency of chloride channels opening. So does Xanax, aka Alprazolam. So those drugs are both benzodiazepines and they increase the frequency of the GABA chloride channels opening. Two more drugs to remember. Gabapentin, I actually think you'll hear about this again a little bit later in the course. And this drug will block calcium channels and it's a GABA agonist. It's excreted through the kidney, so you can't use gabapentin in kidney failure because you're just gonna overwork the kidneys in this patient. So I would remember that fact. And it's also used for neuropathic pain. So I think about people who have just had carpal tunnel surgery or are suffering from some kind of nerve in injury. They'll generally be prescribed gabapentin or something to help that neuropathic type of nerve pain. And that's usually what I associate gabapentin with. 
And I remember that gabapentin works centrally because it has the word GABA in it. It's working with GABA, it's central, inhibitory. Pregabalin, this also has the word GABA in it, working centrally. This drug is used for chronic spasm. Okay, and I think, there we go. I got kind of smart this week and I hit the answers for review questions. What are the two types of peripheral neuromuscular blockers? So if you remember the peripheral are put in purple in this document. Here's a, you know, general schematic with the answers included. So the two types of peripheral neuromuscular blockers. Remove the highlight. Depolarizing and non-depolarizing. And if you recall, depolarizing increases the action potentials until the muscle is fatigued, while non-depolarizing is an antagonist of the acetylcholine receptor in the muscle and blocks the action potential. So, oh, well, Here's the answer for the next question. <laughs> Their mechanisms of action differ because depolarizing causes lots of action potential and leads to fatigue. As where non-depolarizing antagonizes the acetylcholine receptor in the muscle and blocks the action potential. Which spasmolytic can be used in pregnancy? If you remember, Say clobenzaprine. It's okay for a pregnant woman to ride a cycle and it's pregnancy class B because there is a B. So that's your answer. Cyclobenzaprine. How do spasmolytics cause central inhibition? So generally, they'll hyperpolarize the neurons and no action potential can be made. And if we remember, GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. I think that's how you spell neurotransmitter. And it uses chloride. The charge of chloride is negative. And by making the neurons more negative, the action potential can't pass because the action potential has to make the nerve cells more positive. So by introducing more of a negative charge, we're hyperpolarizing the cells and they can't create that positive action potential. So spasmolytics work centrally, usually through GABA, by causing hyperpolarization. And let's add one more question in here, just because I think it's good to remember. Which drugs, neuromuscular blockers, or analytics are more highly ionized? And what happens because of this? So the answer is gonna be neuromuscular blockers. Because they're highly ionized, they can't pass the blood-brain barrier and they remain peripheral. Okay, I think that's everything for week three. If you guys have any questions about weeks one, two, or three, feel free to send me an email and hopefully you should have access to these notes. If you don't, also send me an email and we'll get them to you. And as always, good luck with studying and feel free to reach out if you have any questions.